Washington football. Woo! Everybody and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host Kyle, and I am joined by my co-host Michael Hall. But we are joined by special guest Ryan Roberts of Rising Draft, draft analyst for Coast to Coast Scouting. How are you doing tonight, Ryan? I'm good, guys. How are you? Doing, doing fantastic, doing Ryan. I'm glad that we were able to finally get you on here because right now is the lull time between in, until training camp starts. So, without further ado, let's jump right into this thing. Jamin Davis, the first rounder, there's a lot of uh, national right analysts saying that he's the favorite for defensive rookie of the year. This would be Washington's back-to-back player to do that. Do you see Jamin Davis possibly having that kind of influence in his first year? I mean, I think he's set up perfectly. I mean, we we always talk about how rookie success is dictated upon situation that they're thrown into, right? So we're talking about a defensive line that has Chase Young and Montez Sweat and Jonathan Allen. And then on the back end, they're improving. I know Cameron Curl had a good season. I know the cornerback unit has been very improved this offseason, obviously. So I think that the missing piece of what Ron Rivera has always had is that prototype middle linebacker who is able to run sideline to sideline, make a ton of plays, has a little bit of freedom. And for the when, when it first came off the board, when I was like 19th overall pick for, for John and Davis, like it's not – for me, I, I wasn't a huge fan of him at 19. Mm. But when you take a step back and you say, Ron Rivera has always done an incredible job of developing linebackers, and he's going to be around these defensive stalwarts both in front of him and in the back. If there is a situation that he's going to get thrown into and be successful, I think it's Washington. So I, I'm a big fan of the fit there more than anything. And I'm always going to give Ron Rivera his respect and give him – his courtesy to see how he develops linebackers because he has a obviously a great track record of doing so. Right. Yeah, totally agree. And sticking with the defensive side of the ball, um, over the past two previous seasons in the third round, uh, Washington's gone Terry McLaurin, and then the next year Antonio Gibson. Obviously, those were home run hits so far into the their careers. This year they took Diami Di- Brown and Benjamin St. Juice. Um, what can we expect from them going into the season? And do you think they're going to have an impact on either side of the ball? Yeah, I, th- I think Diami's is an interesting player. Another guy that I think situation is going to dictate some success early on, because I think what it, I don't want to say it was surprising, but so Terry McLaurin was used, you know, obviously a standout special teamer, but he was really kind of a vertical threat at Ohio state, more of a, a chunk play type of guy. And I think that the development that he had in year two as an all around option where you can line him up inside, outside. He could be an intermediate, short route runner, create instant separation. He can do a lot of things. So now what Diami Brown was really successful at, at, at North Carolina was he was thrown into the boundary, and he was a guy that won on the vertical play in the field. And I don't think outside of Terry that there's a consistent player on the offense right now that gives you that vertical element. I know, you know, Steven Sims has some speed, but I know he's really struggled with drops and consistency. So you're looking for that guy for me that is able to stretch the field on top of a Terry McLaurin and then let Logan Thomas hit the intermediate level of the field. Let's get Antonio Gibson more involved in the passing game. I feel like that was a really good situation for him because I know some people were talking about him in the late first round. I never bought into that, but in the third round, grabbing a guy with that type of speed and that type of vertical element, I think is is fantastic. And then you mentioned Benjamin St. Juice. I was surprised that Ben didn't go a little earlier, to be honest, because he's a – prototypical six three plus corner right that is becoming more and more like you want that press man corner that has the ability to play in the boundary and and get up in the line of scrimmage getting players grills and then he has some dynamic short shuttle and and just short explosiveness to his game as well and solid enough speed so i know he was a guy that didn't record an interception during his career, but I think there was ball production. I think that there is a baseline to develop into a very good corner. And in the mm-hmm. third round, I think you're taking a gamble on upside and, and that type of athletic skill set. I think that both third round picks are in great situations to succeed. And I don't think they're going to be pressed into duty, uh, you know, a ton early. I, I mean, especially say juice. I don't think he's going to be a guy that you're going to throw for a high volume early on. Deami Brown might play a little more of a prevalent role to buy with maybe Kelvin Harmon coming back from injury. But I think that both those guys with the skill sets they have in the third round, I, I think as a can't miss a couple picks. Now to piggyback off of your uh, analysis of Diami Brown, you know, a lot of the people were saying that 
We had Logan Paulson, a former Washington tight end, who knows his stuff and knows how to watch film. One thing that concerned him about Diami Brown was that he was kind of a one deep threat kind of wide receiver, and he only lined up on the left side. So let me ask you, is Diami Brown strictly a deep threat, or is he capable of being an all-around wide receiver, in your opinion? I, I think he I think he has flexibility to his game. So when I'm okay. looking at the traits that would – Tra- translate to becoming a better route runner. I think he has all those elements. Unfortunately, he's in Phil Longo's offense at North mm. Carolina where <laughs> it was DK Metcalf, right? Like he was his DK Metcalf, even right. though he's three inches shorter and, and 20 pounds lighter. It's just that that's the vertical stretch guy that's going to play into the boundary, play on the left side. It is troubling for him early on in his development because I think that mm. if you're going to try to get a bunch out of Deami Brown, I think that it is going to just be in the vertical element early on. But I do think that he has growth potential because I don't I don't see like a limited athlete flexibility right. wise. I don't think I don't see slow feet. So there's no reason that I don't think that he can't develop it. It's just something where I think that you have to ask him to do what he does best right now and then further that development as he continues to develop. Yeah. And with the second round pick, they took right tackle Sam Cosme out of University of Texas. Um, he's been getting great, uh, great reviews so far from the uh, guys like Brandon Sheriff and this uh surprised with his strength his speed how uh, agile he is how athletic he is mm-hmm. the uh obviously like they let go of uh washington sorry washington let go of morgan moses this offseason so that kind of made room for sam cosby to be sam cosby to potentially be the starter do you see him being the day one starter or do you think it's going to take some time for him to develop this was my first my, this is my favorite pick of washington's draft okay. i I was sold that he was going to go in the first rounds because this kid is, he had, he had shorter arms. So he was under the 33 inch arm length. That is usually the threshold, right? So that was a little troubling, but for me, I only really care about that is if a guy is also just a solid to below average athlete. For me, he can overcompensate for a lack of arm length with the athleticism he has. And we were talking about the athletic testing and just the, the feet that he has on film. I think he's a rare athlete. I think that this kid could potentially be the starting left tackle down the road. But mm. luckily for wa- Washington is that the fact of he started at right tackle, he started at left tackle, there's versatility to him. He, he He's literally a guy that you could say, let's find a spot for him because he's one of the five best offensive linemen on the field. And I know Morgan Moses has been a good football player for a few years. So I'm not going to say that it is, you know, it's going to be a seamless transition because they're, you know, rookie offensive tackles rarely ever are unless you're guys like, that we just saw last year, like Tristan Wirfs of the world and Jidrick Wills. <laughs> so I, I think that there's going to be a little bit of an a- acclimation period that's going to need to happen. But I think that that athletic profile and then the experience that he has both the left and right tackle, I was shocked that he did, that he got out of the first round, to be honest. Wow. And that's good to hear for Washington's yeah. standpoint, given the fact that they did just release Morgan Moses. Now, one of the safeties that were selected in the draft for Washington was Derek Forrest out of Cincinnati. I was able to watch a little bit of his film briefly Ryan, and I did think that he was a very good cover safety, you know, kind of opportunistic, was able to go and had sticky fingers, was able to bring down the ball. I heard an analyst say they thought that he was possibly one of the best cover safeties in this draft this year. What was your assessment of Derek Forrest? Do you think that he could be somebody future down the line starting at free safety? I think that what he does in as a deep zone safety on the roof is he reminds me a little bit of Rodney McLeod that started mm. with the Eagles for a long time. Like I don't think he's the rangiest player playing in that role, but I think that he's always in the right spot. Like he's never going to kill you. He's never going to give up the big play. What I really saw in film of him that I was a little surprised by was I thought when they rolled him down, because they had James Wiggins, who was another good athlete yeah. in safety who dealt with some injuries, but they – there are a lot of rotations in Marcus Freeman's defense. So he would actually come down and he would play almost like a nickel mm. in man coverage in the slot a ton. And I thought that he had good hips, good feet, good understanding of leverage. Everything was good. I think that he's kind of a, a, a do it all type of safety. I don't know if he has a calling card where I say I can, I can, you know, I can really count on that on a full time basis, but I think that he is what the NFL is looking for in these players that, Hey, I could, I could show too high early, and then I could roll either way with him. He could play on the roof. He can come down in the slot. He can do a lot of different things. And, I mean, you guys just struck gold a little bit, it seems, with Cameron Col- Cameron Curl last mm-hmm. year in the later rounds too. So if, I think in the right situation, if you're if you're really playing off of his strengths, I feel like he could be a sub-package guy for you pretty early, at least get him on the field in some reps. Right. And 
Going into the draft, tight end was a position of need for Washington. They took John Bates in the fourth round. At first, I was kind of like iffy on the pick because I didn't really watch a lot of him. <laughs> Went back to watch some film on him. I was hearing that he's uh, they have potential to be a good pass catcher. I know our tight end coach turned Logan Thomas into a pretty good to decent tight end. So what do you see from John Bates? Do you think he can be a good number two opposite Logan Thomas? It's kind of like what I was talking about with Ron Rivera. Like, I always give him the benefit of the doubt with developing linebackers. Yeah. What you just did with Logan Thomas, like you said, I mean, the early on in the season, I was like, well, that dude does not belong in a football field, Logan <laughs> Thomas, right? But then by the end of the year, he's one of the most productive tight ends in the National Football League. So you're like, wow, the great development with that. John Bates, for me, is a little bit of a funky guy. Like, he has the body of what you would consider a traditional blocking tight end, and I think he does do pretty nice work in that area. Yeah. But he is a – really noted high school athlete and i think that there is some untapped athleticism to him so i think there's developmental potential as a pass catcher you just haven't seen it a ton on film he wasn't utilized right. a ton in boise right. state's offense over the last couple of years so i think that there's some upside to him i just don't think and i mean he's a fourth round pick so you're not always depending on that guy to play anyway but i think that he's more of a developmental guy maybe a stash him on the end of the roster but i don't think that he's going to play a huge role early on even though it sounds like from the roster construction wise, they do need somebody to step up to be the second tight end. I'm just not sure if John is that guy early on. Hmm. And, that, and that makes sense. It's probably why they brought in Ricky Seals Jones uh, recently, yeah. the proven veteran that could be a number two easily. Now mm -hmm. in the off season, Washington lost Ryan Anderson and they lost Ryan Kerrigan to the Philadelphia Eagles. So the backup pass rusher position is kind of a big question mark. So Ryan, do you think that Shaka Tony and William Bradley King give should bring confidence to Washington fans if they're going to be the backups at pass rusher this season? I, I think that if you're asking them to do some very departmentalized things that they could do some good things for you. They're kind of a little bit of opposite football players in the sense of like they are similar body types. They're similar. They're constructed pretty, you know, even I think their arm length is almost the same. Their body types are near the same. William Bradley King is a very physical edge setter though. He's more of the run stopping outside linebacker kind of stand up rusher type uh, had a nice year at Baylor this year after transferring over from Arkansas state. So I think there's a good baseline as a guy that's a rotational piece. Shaka Tony on the other hand is that dude's first step is lightning quick. He yep. is your traditional, like if you're looking for a guy that's going to be a situational pass rusher, quote unquote, that might be your guy. So I think that, Neither player is a complete football player, but I think if you're asking them to do what they do best, that they could uh, potentially uh, contribute early on. Yeah, that's definitely bold as well for this defense because we, we said it before, and go back to that playoff game last year when Montez Sweat and Chase Young needed a break. The drop-off and pass rush was just devastating, and obviously Tom Brady carved us up. Um, jumping forward to next year's draft, I know it's like way, way, way early, but going into the season – the big talk was, are they, is Washington going to draft a quarterback? I know Justin Fields was talked about a lot. They end up going with Ryan Fitzpatrick, who's probably going to go into the season as a starter. But going forward, they're going to need a quarterback in 2022. Who's some of your guys in 2022 that you like going into the, the draft? So my, my top quarterbacks that I've evaluated so far, I think that there was an early opinion out, kind of thrown out there that this next year's quarterback class was not very good. Yeah. I think that's a misconception. Every to be year. Honest. I mean, it's it's not it's not this like you're not going to get a Trevor Lawrence in this draft. Obviously, you're not even going to get a Justin Fields or a Trey Lance, in my opinion. Like the, there's there's more question marks than there are answers right now. But I have said like I think that the depth of this class is fantastic. But if we're looking for a quarterback in the first round, my top rated guy, which I, I know is a little bit of a hot take, I guess. But Carson Strong from Nevada is my guy right now. I think that mm. that kid size arm strength he kind of plays in that funky air raid system out in nevada but man he's he has had the most um the most experience of setting protections at the line of scrimmage has given a lot of freedom pre-snap and i think that the the maturation you saw from 2019 to 2020 was fantastic with the kid and i mean deep ball is fantastic there's a lot to like about a guy like carson strong and then you run into the guys that are more well known like the the Spencer Rattlers of the world, who I think are definitely going to be in that early to mid first round conversation. I think the kid from a talent perspective, i probably has the best arm in the draft, you know, just thrown from awkward arm angles and thrown from a compromised platform. And he's a good athlete can win outside of structure. Like there's a lot to like the maturation questions with him are just a little 
troubling. I, I know I don't want to hmm. pass judgment on a player based upon a TV show, but like <laughs> there yeah, are yeah. some acts to him that like do rub you the wrong way a little bit, you know? So I think that we always talk about the quarterback evaluation is most in depth, like more the, well, I don't want to say more, obviously the eye in the sky is always what matters most what's on tape, but the ability to talk to those kids, to see what type of leaders they are, the background, how much they, they just love football. Like that really does matter at the quarterback position. I, for me, it would make or break Spencer Rattler for me on my board, being able to sit down with him and just seeing how much the game means to him. And I would really love to see that. And then you you got guys, again, like Sam Howell, who I'm not quite as high on. I, I, I'm struggling with him a little bit in mm. the mid-first round. Like, I think that I think that eventually I will come around to him maybe being somewhere in the first, but, like, I'm just not there with him. Keaton Slovis is a guy from USC that I'm a big fan of. For me, from a technical perspective, he is the most – advanced quarterback in this class wow. he's been working with kurt warner since he was a high, a high school player so mm. he um he has the technical aspects of the game kind of had a more down 2020 comparative to his freshman year where he was fantastic because he was dealing with a shoulder injury and i mean that pac-12 season which i think he only played like four or five games with that you know abbreviated season so it's kind of hard to pass judgment on him but i think that they're or quality up top, but I think that the, when we're talking about 2022 NFL draft for quarterbacks, I think that the depth is what's really going to set that class apart. Yeah, and it's never too early to talk draft. I'll tell you that Ever, right now. Man. Never, <laughs> never, never, Ryan, never. never. <laughs> now, to bring this back, there was an undraft. We only drafted Washington only brought in one undrafted free agent, and that was Jarrett Patterson. Watching his film, it looked like he was running through holes the size of volcanoes. Uh, you know, it was ridiculous yep. how good his offensive line was. I wasn't overly impressed, but it looks like at training camp, he's really turned some heads for Washington, even getting accolades from Ron Rivera saying he reminded him of Darren Sproles from back of the Charger days. So in your opinion, what did we miss on film with Jarrett Patterson? Like, Why was he an undrafted? And uh, do you think that he could possibly produce in some way this season? Yeah, I, I was surprised that he wasn't drafted because I, I think I had – I think I ended up with like a fifth round grade on him. So I wasn't oh, like wow. high on him. Right. right. But like I, I did like him. I right. thought that he was a draftable player and could fit a situation. You know, it, unfortunately for him, anytime you're small and not that athletic, mm-hmm. eh, <laughs> you know, like you, you can have one or the other. If you're small, right. you better be like comparing him to Darren Sproles. Darren Sproles was lightning fast and ran in the four threes. Like right. that, that, that guy is, you know, he overcompensates for his lack of size. So, Jarrett is not going to win any beauty pageants as a football player. Like people are just, it, they're going to hesitate with him, but the film is good. He has good contact balance. He, he, I mean, he has natural, natural leverage in the run game, right? Like he just has that, that low center yep. of gravity, able to break tackles. Wasn't used a ton in the passing game, but for me, for a guy to transition to the next level and make an impact potentially, you have to dominate the level of competition if you're not a power five player. He was a group of five at Buffalo in the MAC, dominated MAC competition. I mean, just absolutely. I mean, he ran yeah. for like a thousand yards. Yeah, eight five touchdowns in a game. Yeah. yeah. Oh my. Yeah, I know. Well, I hate that game so much. I know. Me too. Broke the rushing record and they <laughs> took him out for whatever reason. Oh man, that, that grinded my gears. But it was. I mean, he dominated every player that he went against. So I, I don't think that there's definitely no baseline for him to be a starting caliber player but you know, hide him on the roster maybe he can contribute on special teams and then he's your jd mckissick in a couple of years when he walks eventually like that i think that there's a solid baseline for that yeah i i mean if you go from undrafted to maybe getting yeah. a roster spot and then contributing can't go wrong with that um so washington as a whole i feel like the draft grade for me, me personally, I might be a little bit biased, is uh, maybe like a B plus to an, an A range. Um, last year, they brought in Cam Curl, drafted him in the seventh round. He came in, had a huge impact on this defense. Do you see anybody offensive-wise or defensive-wise in this rookie class for Washington kind of come in and making that impact this year? Outside of uh, Jamie. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, a lot of the guys, obviously, that, that we, we talked to, and I, I actually agree with you. I, I think I ended up giving it a B plus grade, so I'm right there with you. I mean, okay. if we're talking about guys that – you know, a little further down, like we talked about Shaka Tony, you mentioned like, Hey, we need that, that backup pass rusher. I feel like he could be that guy. I think that Deami Brown is going to play a ton. I think Ben St. Juice is not going to be a guy in 2021 that is going to impact the game a ton, but like down the line, I think that Washington had a very solid draft. You know, I, I they even drafted a long snapper, I think, right? Yeah. Cheese Cameron Cheeseman. Yeah. Too. The cheese. I mean, he might, if, if he's, a, if he's a sorry long snapper, he might have the biggest impact on the team in yeah, 2021, at least. <laughs> so, 
Um, yeah, I think that I think that they did a really nice job. I wasn't like, a big fan of the, their last pick with with um, I don't even know how to pronounce the BYU kid's name, Mil- Milne or Milne. Dax Milne. Yeah. Milne, Dax Milne. Okay. Um, yeah. So I think they did a really nice job. Like I said, I, I think that that Saka Tony is a guy that could potentially affect the game on passing situations. I think Deami Brown's going to play a role. I think Sam Cosby probably was is going to start and do a nice job. And then John and Davis, like like we're saying, you know, he might be the early runner, uh, uh, front runner for the defensive rookie of the year. So I think Washington did a very good job, and I I definitely agree with the B plus grade. I think it, I think they did a for with what they had, and I know that the debate, the internal debate, was probably do we try to be aggressive and move up to a court for a quarterback yeah. this year? I get that conversation, but for where they were with the 19th pick, I think that they did a very good job. Thank you for elaborating on that. That was going to be one of my questions to you. But, Ryan, to wrap this up, we have a new segment that we do. Like, So we have fans send in would-you-rather questions. So I have one for you, and it's draft-based. You're the GM of your of your own football team. You're coordinating everything. You're going up to the draft. Would you rather have a late first-round pick and a bunch of day three picks or a top first-rounder and minimum and minimal day three picks? Oh, definitely, definitely late first and, and multiple uh, okay. third round picks. So I, I do a podcast with um, David Turner, who was in the scouting industry for 18 years in the NFL, CFL, Arena League. And he is one thing that he told me one of the first times I met him is scouts make their money on day three. Yep. Like anybody can watch a guy like you, you watch Trevor Lawrence throw the ball for about five minutes. You're like, yeah, it's pretty good, man. Like he, he, that's not a, <laughs> it's not a hard evaluation, but right. finding the Cameron curls of the world. Right. That's what sets people apart. And for me, I mean, I, that's always been my joy is trying to find those diamonds in the rough, trying to find those day three sleepers, trying to find the late day two sleepers, like trying to find the guys that maybe people don't value as much, but you found and you see something in them. So I would definitely go late first and a high capital on day three. Yeah. Thank you. That's that, I'm right there with you, dude. I feel yeah. the exact same way. And I'm glad that you didn't come in here telling us we should have traded up for Justin Fields. I would have, uh, <laughs> I, the I, I wasn't going to do that to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ryan. I can't thank you enough. Uh, so can you tell everyone where they can find you, uh, where your pod, what platforms your podcasts on and what social media platforms they could find you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I am on Twitter at rise and draft. Um, if you are just looking directly on sites, I'm on, Coast to Coast Scouting, where all my scouting reports are. I'm on Expand the Box Score, where the featured pieces that I'm going to be writing for 2022. It's a little in-depth interview-like type of articles. And then for podcast, oh, I'm also on irishbreakdown.com, which is the Sports Illustrated for covering Notre Dame, if any Notre Dame fans are out there. And then uh, for podcasts, we're on Apple, Spotify, all the good stuff. You can do Mav Sports Take, which is covering the business of sports, a little more Mm -hmm. of a wide angle. And then believe in NFL draft po- prospects podcast on the believe podcast network. If you just want your NFL draft fix. No, oh, thank you so much, Ryan. I know looking at your uh, Twitter bio, you have so many jobs. It's ridiculous. How many tags you got in there? I can't thank <laughs> you to, enough, sir. Try, absolutely guys. I appreciate you guys having me. Of course. Yeah, best man. of luck to you. Right. We'll have you back on soon. All right. Sounds good, man. Appreciate it. All right. Yeah, right. I'll see you. All right. That was a great interview of our guy, Ryan Roberts. That was fantastic. I can't thank him enough for uh, taking some time out to be able to come out and join us and talking some football. Yes, sir. Yeah. I mean, again, like you said, never to early start talking draft. So, yeah. And I'm glad it. I'm glad that you picked up where I was getting off with um with those draft picks and going down the list and figuring out more and more yeah. about each one. I'm glad that you did that. Uh, and then asking about next year's QB class. That was uh. That was huge. I know you and I are usually on the same page anyway. You know what yes I mean? Sir, yes, sir. All right. So this week's freestyle is our boy, uh, Meast. He is on Twitter, Brandon Reinbold. Uh, so I asked him for this freestyle. And the, the whole thought process for the freestyle segment is I'm asking your gu- you guys a question. You know, we usually ask four questions. I'm asking you a question, and you have to answer for us. Give us an interview so everyone can find out what your opinion is. And what I asked him is, should Washington fans kind of lower their expectations for the Washington football team heading into this season? And let's hear what he has to say. You all know what it is. It's the freestyle on the Burgundy Zone with your boy Meese. Let's get it. Do Washington fans need to dial back their expectations for this season? Answer, no. Coming off a division title and perhaps the toughest division in the NFL where it's been 15 years since a team has won back-to-back titles, we need to raise the expectations. Great teams carry high expectations. Last year, our defense carried us and built us out to a division title, 
into the playoffs with a second-ranked defense in the entire NFL with horrific quarterback play, looking like they were auditioning for a circus. In the offseason, we upgraded the quarterback room majorly, and our offense got faster. May say it take some time for them to gel together, get the chemistry down. Till then, our defense will carry us like it did last year. Chase Young believes we have the tools to be the best defense in the NFL. With that in our schedule alone, comes with high expectations. All right. Thank you so much, Brandon. You are the man. Make sure you go find him on Twitter at Meast21. But do you agree with him, Hall, that Washington fans shouldn't bring down their expectations? They should actually pump them up for their expectations based on how they played last season, given all the circumstances. Chase Young winning Defensive Rookie of the Year coming back and then getting Matt Ioannidis and stuff back. How, do you agree that maybe the expectations that we're holding Washington should be higher? Um, I wouldn't go higher. I would. Pr- they're probably set right where they should be. I know me personally, I've always been a proponent of this team has talent. This team needs to be talked about a lot more nationally. It's just – we don't ever really get the wins to produce the yeah. national the national talk. But I mean, now every that, time they went on a national scale, they got butt whooped. I mean, exactly, and that yeah. was also part of it. It's kind of like, do we want to put them on a national stage because it's going right. to be an embarrassment anyway? So uh, I'm kind of glad that Ron Rivera's come in, he's flipped everything around. He's getting this, a lot of buzz around the team. They're getting talked about nationally, ESPN, NFL Network. Some analysts even have them as the division winner, division favorite. Yep, and that's kind of where my expectations are. Where we're neck and neck with Dallas right now, I feel like. I think that they are the division favorite, and right underneath us is Dallas. And I think that double-digit wins should be the expectation, nothing more, nothing less. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. Man, you're stealing my stealing my job, man. <laughs> I've, been, I've been saying since February that the expectation for this team should be winning the division at least. And that should be the expectation. That's what they did last year. They got so much better all around the football team and all their areas of weakness. They really did add depth and quality pieces uh, to there. They didn't just throw a bunch of randos at it. They actually went in and did due diligence, and they did a really good job with replenishing that. So thank you, Brandon. That was fantastic. As always, you're great, dude. I can't thank you enough. Now, I wanted to ask your opinion because Coach Rivera recently, we haven't talked about this yet on the pod, but he said he brought in Luke Keekley to kind of coach up the linebackers. I wanted to ask your opinion on that because I absolutely love that. Yeah, 100% love that. Obviously, Luke Keekley is going to be a Hall of Famer. He's a legend in this game. One of the top linebackers in the league for many, many, many years. Uh, would probably still be in the league if it wasn't for, like, all the concussions he had, honestly. Yeah. And, yeah, it's just one of those guys where Ryan was just on here talking about where Ron Rivera is known for having that middle of the field linebacker, that field general. So for him to come in, talk to these linebackers, especially after the year they had last year where he was kind of getting on them all year into the media. Obviously, he was probably getting on them in practice as well. So for someone to come in, been around Coach Rivera for all those years, knows the system like the back of his hand, knows what he what he wants and expects out of his linebacker core. So I definitely love it. And look, I know I don't think Keekley's on a coaching staff right now. Mm-mm. I mean, they got a, they got an open spot for him as a consultant. Even you know, it wouldn't it wouldn't hurt. Yeah, we even said that last year uh, when yeah. he was running around. Uh, he had just retired, and we were saying, "Hey, dude, come here. You know, coach up the linebackers. We could definitely use it." And Luke Kuechly was drafted by Ron Rivera, plugged right in, and was calling plays for the defense in his first year. I absolutely love this for Jamin Davis in particular because it is a huge difference from going from college to the pros. Obviously, he played in the SEC, didn't play at the, the most powerful or learn from the best, but at the same time, Luke Kuechly came from Boston College, and that wasn't really a barn burner by any stretch, but he came in. So that type of guy like Luke Keekley, who doesn't come from like a huge school that's profound, that has the best of the best teaching him, he is probably the best person possible to teach Jamin on how to transition to the NFL, being the cap, not the captain, but the guy calling the plays on defense and not having it go, him being head over heels, not thinking that he's in too way over his head. You know what I mean? Yeah, Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that definitely helps him come out, play free. And look, when you're when you're overthinking things in NFL, I mean any level of football, any level of sports, when you're overthinking things, you're playing a lot slower. You got to stop thinking about things. You kind of hesitate. When you're just playing free, you know what you're supposed to do. You can see everything in front of you. You're gonna play fast. You're gonna play free, and you're gonna make plays. And hopefully, Luke Keekley came in, explained that, which they have, they obviously knew that, but it it sounds better coming from someone that actually did it and knows how to do it 
and has done it before and knows what the coach wants right. to expect. Exactly. 150% exactly. Uh, today on Twitter, uh, Benjamin St. Juice put up that picture of all the, the rookie class of this year all posing with their shirts off with nothing but shorts on. They're all flexing. Samus Reyes is actually in there as well. Yeah. Um, it, it had everyone up in, up in riots. But look, man, I just wanted to make a comment. If, if there's anything to take away from that picture, it's the fact that you can't tell who's the O-lineman and who's not. And, <laughs> yeah. and that should tell you something, that they're all athletes. They're all yeah. well-built. You don't have just a bunch of – you don't have a bunch of overweight, strong guys out there. you got guys that can literally do anything on the football field, and, that's, and I think that's huge for Washington. The fact that you can't tell who's, line, who's the offensive lineman, who's the linebacker, and who's not. Benjamin St. Juice is one of the tallest guys in that picture. I was really <laughs> yeah. blown away by that. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, look, versatility, versatility, versatility. They've been preaching that since day one when they came in. And what what better to have versatility than a bunch of guys that are athletic as hell, all built the same, all cock diesel, just walking around like a Terminator, but right. can run, like, <laughs> but still like fast as hell, athletic as hell. So oh, look, I love it. And look, they've been killing the, the draft for the past like four or five years, to be honest with you. So it just it only bodes well for the future going forward. Yeah, and look, uh, if Sam Cosby's nickname isn't the Mountain, um, we're doing something <laughs> very wrong here. I will say that right now. The guy looks like the Mountain. I'm gonna tell you he that. He really does. It's so funny. He's gigantic. <laughs> He's way too big for that. That body size is just ridiculous. Now let's move on to our fan questions, and we're gonna start with the Colonel, none other than he said with Gilbert Garrett and Ben DiNucci as backups for Dallas. How precarious is it? How vaunted that offensive situation is, given Dak's injury history. Um. Yeah. I mean, look. You see what the you see what it was last year. I mean, Andy Dalton obviously is a much much better capable backup than those guys. Obviously, we injured him. Sorry about that, Andy. Um. <laughs> but yeah. I mean. I mean. Hey. It's it's bad for Dallas and it kind of sucks. But at the end of the day, it's a, it's a contact sport. It's a hard hitting sport. If you get injured, you get injured. And obviously, I would feel better about this team beating the teams at full strength. I know. Everyone last year, if you look on Twitter, oh, you only won the division because the division was so weak. This person was injured. That person was injured. Blah, 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 blah. Hey, look, we had injuries too. Hmm. We're not complaining. We still won games. Right. So at the end of the day, it's next man up mentality. And it just goes to show that this coaching staff realizes that over these past like years before they got here, they were the, one of the most injured teams in the league. So the way to prevent that, build depth, build guys that know what they're doing, get guys in here that, again, position flexibility versatility they can play multiple positions it got everything covered so i mean look like i said hopefully dallas hopefully dax is healthy this season because it will make nothing more better than my life than to beat them with full strength yeah. all their weapons on offense all their weapon weapons on defense and for us to beat them full strength as well so i'm looking forward to it and hopefully it'll stay healthy yeah, look, I do think it is concerning for Dallas because everyone is cons – like, and it's no fault to anybody, you know, because it's just a normal, like, natural thing to do. But everyone is kind of assuming that Dak is going to come back and be the person that he was before the injury. And I, you're right. That is a very – that's a thin line to cross there because there could be easily him taking a step back and the offense dragging butt because he's not – used to it he's getting back from the injury and that could wholeheartedly happen I just feel like they are built and they have that camaraderie built already and so it's going to be okay um, but I will say that they should be concerned especially because he just got paid a whole lot generally naturally humans when we get paid we get that kind of reassurance we don't have the same fight as we did before but I'm not going to discount Dak you know I, I've talked so much crap about Dak and I'm eating my words after the QB, the QB play we've seen in Washington over the past two years. I mean, we'd be lucky to have Dak, of course, oh, yeah. but it, but it's not like I'm scared of the guy, you know. Yeah, of course. I mean, like I said, we were talking about before we started recording. People are acting like, I mean, look, he's dominated us yes, you're right, but we've also had the most like ridiculous, horribly ridiculous defensive coordinators in the league for the past <laughs> couple years. Prior to last year, and they were playing a three-four defense, which Joe Barry is a saint. <laughs> <laughs> Don't talk about Manubski like that. <laughs> Jordan no, Mantooth is a saint. <laughs> right. Now, but seriously, though, I think that I want to see what this defense does against a guy like Dak Prescott, who right. look, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hate on Dak Prescott. He's a good quarterback. He's a yeah. top top six, seven quarterback in this league. He like is. easily. So, like I said before, I want to see what our defense full strength against him full strength clash heads, and I think we'll come out on top. 
Yeah, absolutely. Now let's move on to Jeff Miles. He's got a couple questions for us. Make sure you guys go follow him on Instagram. He's got those great designs for the uniform and the rebrand for the team. So it's a lot of fun. It's a worthy follow. He wants to know, what name would you give to any dominant unit on this team if they're great? Like, for example, the DBs, wide receivers, D-line, or even the defense altogether. He said the Hogs and Legion of Boom were great ones in the past. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, that's a tough one. Well, you go first. I want to think about this real quick. You going to think about it? Oh, shoot. Uh, for the, I guess you would have to go with the D-line. Um, you could call them the Storm. Uh, I would say, in a way, that's the name I would come up with them because when they're on the field, it's like you're in the storm with all those guys lining up. You don't know who's coming at you, where they're coming from. All you know is that they're coming fast and they're hitting you very, very hard. The wind's coming. You better hold on to something, hold on to your butt, and, and seek shelter. That's what I feel. Man, um, I think if I had to name – it's already been used before, so I don't really want to like go with it. But it's one that I can think of off the top of my head. I might think of something later, just randomly blurt it out. So if I just like randomly say something out of nowhere, that's probably what it is. Um, I'll go with no fly zone for the DBs, the back seven. I think that upgrading William Jackson to go along opposite with Kendall Fuller. You got guys like Jimmy Moreland, obviously Kendall or Cameron Curl on the back end. I think Landon Collins coming back. I think he's gonna want to prove everybody wrong, prove everybody that I'm still one of the good best safeties in the league and I deserve the contract, and I deserve to be in this league as a starter. So I'd, I'll call them the no-fly zone because I think that they're going to be uh, locked down. I think William Jackson going to lock down half the field this year, and I think that there's going to be no catches deep, which was killer last year in the first half of this season. Yeah, and that, that makes a lot of sense. I guess the other one you could go with would be like the wide receivers. Uh, you go like the Justice League or something like that because they're all like superhero athletes. They all have their own little niche that they do. But besides that, I know we're kind of going on a weird thing. Yeah, here, but... I was trying to, like, think of something with the wide receivers and, like, had to do with, like, speed because, like, mm -hmm. they're all fast as hell, but I couldn't think of something. So I was just like, no, I'll go with the easy one. <laughs> go with the easy one. Now, his next question for us is, which player in Washington history deserves a Ray Lewis-like statue outside of the stadium? Ooh, that is a good – well, see, it, that's so easy to it's say. It's going to be easy because everyone's going to say Sean. I know. That's why I didn't want to – I was going to – obviously, Sean, that's, like – everyone's number one answer hopefully they'll do that one day because the dude's a legend um but outside of sean taylor i would go again it's kind of low hanging fruit because i was gonna say doug williams but i'll go doug williams just because the uh history behind like what he did being the first Afri -Amer african-american quarterback to win a super bowl obviously he won it for washington which makes it even better um the joe gibbs era so there's a lot of significance there because that was the glory days for the team so, I mean, if you want to say player, I'll, also I'll go coach. You can go put Joe Gibbs out there as well. Oh, fuck, dude, you just, you just, ha you just. But, I knew as soon as you said his name, I was like, he's gonna, he's gonna think of it. I know as soon as you said his name. But I'm not gonna go into depth. I'll just go with Doug Williams because Doug's my guy. We had him on the show, great guy, and the the significance behind him winning that Super Bowl. Yeah, uh, that's a good one. I would say it, it with Joe Gibbs by far, because uh, arguably the best head coach in NFL history, one of the, the only one to win three Super Bowls with three different quarterbacks. But if I had to go with player, with no disrespect to Sean, I, I understand I understand the grasp and how everything was, but if we're going to go with that statue, it has to be Sammy Ball. Uh, what he meant to this team, he was literally everything, played quarterback, played defense, uh, safety, then play, and then was kicker as well. So he literally did everything. And if you're talking about the one player that deserves a statue in front of the st stadium, it's Sammy Ball. He was the best of the best that we had to, had to offer besides Joe Gibbs. And I think I Joe, so I'm going to cheat and say Joe Gibbs, but if I have to go player, I'll go Sammy Ball. I will go really, really, really good honorable mention. Obviously, the one, the only, number 28, Daryl Green. Yeah. Because dude played in the league 20 years, was a beast, won multiple Super Bowls. I mean, one of the best cornerbacks in Washington history. And not in NFL history because I wouldn't go that far. But one of the staples of this league for like a really, really, really long time. So, honorable mention, obviously, Daryl Green as well. Yeah, and that's a great one. Daryl Green, he's the consummate professional. He's exactly what you would want out of a superstar. He's like Terry McLaurin, but for secondary. You know, just does everything right, fast as heck, and does his job well. So, I, yeah. that's a great one as well, Hall. I really like that one. Now, his last question for us, what feature would you like to see in the new stadium that would put it on the map 
For example, uh, there was hype years ago about this European designer who put a moat around the stadium. Huge flex, but unlikely for the next location. <laughs> <laughs> that is a huge flex. I weird, knew weird flex, but okay. Remember the moat? Would they have? Would they have uh, uh, jet skis on there and stuff? Or <laughs> right? people had like yeah. sailing boats? Come on, dude. <laughs> like, come on, man. Like, it's ridiculous. I mean, it would have been cool. Don't get me wrong. But uh, the one feature I would like to have. What was the whole question? Like one feature we want to see in the state new stadium? Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah, to put it on the map. Something really, really cool. Like, you know, for Dallas, for example, they have that gigantic that jumbotron. jumbotron. So yeah. that took it for Storm. And then the Vegas, you know, they're having like the DJ booth. Uh so like it's kind of like a club, club inside. Yeah. yeah. That is pretty tough. So like, what um, would be the one thing Washington could bring? Let's see. I don't want to steal your idea because I know you're <laughs> <laughs> I already knew um, you were thinking of it, too. <laughs> I like that low-hanging fruit, man. What can I say? Um, <laughs> uh, I'll go – it's not even really like a huge future, like feature, but I just want a stadium that's retractable roof because for the, like the wintertime games, obviously you put the roof over their head. So you can play on the inside. You don't got to worry about the outside elements. And then just being selfish – That'll lend to us like maybe getting a Super Bowl down the line at some point, and that would be like cool to cool as hell to be like in a Super Bowl city, and uh, so yeah, I would go to the retractable roof only for the simple fact of I want to see a Super Bowl eventually come to Washington or Maryland wherever they put the new stadium at, or yeah, I just want to be away from the outside elements. And if if I go to games, I don't want to be sitting in the cold, so that'd be cool too. <laughs> yeah, that would be really good. Uh, for one, I'm going to go with the easy route. I know I'm going to say both of them, but I'm going to go with the easy route and say that I would like for it to have something really cool where you could have, like, the Metro literally pulling up to the stadium. Yeah. So folks can literally walk out of the Metro and walk right into the stadium. Not many stadiums are offering that because everyone kind of has a congestion problem. You're always going to, and you're going to have tens of thousands of people. But that could be something that's like, wow, you can get in and out of the stadium by using the Metro. Let's do that. That's a low-hanging fruit, in my opinion. That's just something that is very hard to do. But regardless, the other one is the one I've said before, and that is the Memorial Wall. Um, obviously, I, I want the name Warriors for the new name, but if not, it's all good. But I would love to see the Memorial Wall used. In D.C., we're known for our memorials, and if you could go up to like an LED type of screen and you could go back and just look up your family members that were there that have served and like you could take a picture of them there say hey I watched I went to the Washington game I visited dad you know that kind of thing like look them up just to have a give a little bit of remembrance and it gives that community and local feel to it and what makes this area so special and remembrance for uh for our veterans so I would love absolutely love like a memorial like that yeah, nah, like I said, I knew that was going to be your go-to, so I was kind of like trying to think of something else. But the the Metro idea is actually a great idea because obviously the Metro now to Landover, you got to walk like a mile and a half from the Metro station just to get to the stadium. Yeah. Obviously, the parking there is like ridiculous. So like that just tends like all the congestion. So to have like a Metro stop, like a five-minute walk from the stadium or even like to have somehow somewhere like an underground like Metro like rail you can get off there. Right, like, that's exactly what I'm there. saying, yeah. Yeah, so that would be cool as hell, and we were the first ones to do it, so that'd be tight. Yeah, my other one was going to be what they've already announced, and I've ac I actually said it to Jason Wright about having the betting inside the stadium, where you yeah. wouldn't have to go to a casino, you wouldn't have to hit up, you wouldn't have to hit up a bookie or anything like that to log in your bets. You could literally walk out of your seat, go to the station, put in your bets for the rest of the NFL, and walk back. I feel like that'd be really cool, but that's just an honorable mention. Now, our next question is from Liam. Thank you, Liam. You're the man. Liam X underscore X on Twitter. What are your season predictions for all of the NFC East teams? And would you rather Washington has a disappointing year we end up getting one of the top QBs in next year's draft or we overperform and have to get another low price bridge quarterback? So, first off, what are your predictions for the NFC East this season? Like record-wise? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, let's not um, go into like what we think their records are going to be, but let's say let's make it easy and say where are they going to fall in the division at the end of the year. Okay, man, that's easy here. Um, obviously, I'll put the Eagles at number four. They're kind of in rebuild mode. I know going in twenty twenty two, they're going to be a team to look out to watch for because they got a bunch of draft picks. They're going to have a bunch of cap space. If Jalen Hurts pans out to be the quarterback, that they have the quarterback set. But I'll go them in the fourth slot. By a narrow third. Actually, you know what? I'm going to switch it up. Hot take. Hot take time. Hot take. Third, I'm going Dallas. 
I think that yeah. this deep, like, although their offense is coming back, Dak's coming back healthy, I think that they're going to be explosive as hell on offense. They're going to be a top offensive uh, team in the league. But the defense, look, I know they brought in Michael Parsons. He's a beast. He's a good-ass linebacker. I know they brought in the, uh, I forget his name, but the corner from uh, Kentucky in the third round. Calvin Decent, Joseph? Uh, Calvin Joseph. Decent, he was actually very good. I loved his tape. Yeah, yeah. Decent cornerback, uh, solid player. I love uh, uh, Trayvon Diggs on the other side as well. Um, so does Terry. Speed it. Yeah. <laughs> rock a bye, baby. You're right. Um, yeah, but I just think that even with Dan Quinn coming in, I know everyone's like, oh, Dan Quinn's coming in. He's rebuilding that Seattle defense, the Legion of Boom. Well, he tried to do that in Atlanta, and look what Atlanta's defense has been for the past two, three years. Horrible. So, with that being said, I don't think that a bunch of rookies, but they, they went all, like, defense in the draft. I yeah, don't think a did. bunch of rookies are going to come in and change no. life in Dallas like that quickly. Might take a little bit. So I'll go to the number three spot, narrowly. Second, I'll go to the Giants. Uh, I just think that with Saquon coming back, they got Kenny Galladay. If he can yeah. stay healthy. Defense is good. It all depends on Daniel Jones, obviously. But if he can not turn the ball over like he did like Jameis Winston, I think that they'll be decent. They definitely uh, Their defense is already like set to win, ready to win now. And they added some more pieces as well. The white James. Of course. Yeah, the white James. And of course, I'm going to go with Washington. Again, yeah. narrowly edging out New York Giants with maybe like a 10 and 7 record, 11 and 6 record, something like that. I got us winning the division back to back, first time since 2000. It's been a long ass time. I can't even remember that song. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I got us one, Giants two, Dallas three, Eagles four. Yeah, look, I, I wholeheartedly agree with your entire list. Um, I will say that there is a possibility that Dallas could be number four on that list. And let me just say this. I'm not being a hater. I'm not, I know, I'm not being a hater. I'm not trying to, like, be a homer for Washington just because you're hating on Dallas. I'm just saying from the outside looking in as a football fan and how things work and stuff, Dallas is literally sitting on a mound of TNT, and there's only a couple feet of dirt that's in between them. And what I mean by that is – they have a running back that's not playing at the best of his ability. He's not in his prime anymore, getting a huge chunk of change. His backup is playing better than him. They just gave a huge contract to their quarterback coming off of a major injury where there was a dispute on him getting the contract or not. They brought in Andy for a flex last season for a reason. They kind of said, you know, Dak, if you want it, you got to play well. Otherwise, Andy's going to come in. You won't get paid. They're bringing in a new, uh, a new defensive coordinator, adding all these guys, these rookies to defense. There is, a, there is a good chance that all of this could rip apart of the seams. Zeke could not be playing well. Jerry Jones gets pissed off paying you all this money, and Don, Tony Pollard's out playing you. Then the other aspect of Dak Prescott just getting paid, come off an injury, he might not do all that well. That could create animosity inside of that locker room between Jerry Jones and Dak and having issues saying Dak's got to play better and maybe Dak and the players lose confidence for it. So I really do believe that the Cowboys are sitting on a huge possible explosion, and that could lay them – back down to number four because we've seen this before there's no confidence in Mike McCarthy if if something bad happens the Cowboys are screwed they are really banking on Dak carrying them because Mike McCarthy cannot we saw that last season so they are very very close from everything imploding right in their face and they are very close to emergency in my personal opinion so I know everyone's going to say it's a hot take but I really truly believe that they are close to it now his huh no, I said it makes sense. Like, everything you're saying, it does make sense. I just think that Dak coming back off the injury, he, like I said, their offense, I'm not worried about the offense. They're going to put up points. It's just, are they going to outscore people? Because the defense right. is not going to be that good. Right. And now uh, the next question was, would you rather Washington have a bad year and get one of the top quarterbacks in 2022, or would you like to have them have a good year, but then we're still going with the lower tier bridge kind of quarterback next season? Um... If it's like the lower tier kind of bridge guy, then I'd probably go with the first option, which, well, I don't want them to do bad either. Cause like, eh. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll go with the second option just for the simple fact of, I don't, it's so hard. Yeah. I'll go with, cause I don't want to see my, Dude, my, so I want, indecisive. <laughs> I know, I know. I, everything in life. It's okay. Um, no one's going to just pick something and run. All right. I'll go with the second option just for the simple fact of, I think that this team is ready to ready to win now. And if they come out and kind of don't live up to what the expectation is next year, I'm afraid that P. 
people are going to start talking from the outside, like, oh, what is Ron Rivera doing? Maybe Dan Snyder starts back in, like, maybe try to take control again or, like, get a little bit of his power back, something like that. So I would go with them having a good season and going for that kind of mid to lower, not lower, but, like, mid-range kind of quarterback like Ryan Patrick again next year. Yeah, Liam, I'm, I'm not sure if you're new here, brother, but I am all about – Winning first and foremost. So the <laughs> latter, all day long, that's what I'm going for. And I've come to the realization, Liam, that we need to stop hoping for a franchise quarterback. We just need to be focused on building the best possible team that we can, and we go with the same blueprint that we've had for the three Super Bowls in the past. Build a juggernaut of a team and have people come in, good, reliable quarterbacks, have a good year, are able to click in the right time and then go far in the playoffs. I feel like that's the only way that we're going to go about this. I don't think the franchise quarterback is ever going to happen. If it was, it was going to happen in 2012. And we kind of saw how life hit us in the face with that. I'm tired of it. I'm just saying we're never going to get a franchise quarterback ever. It's just not going to happen. Maybe we'll luck <laughs> into it. You never know. But uh, go with the latter for that one, definitely. Now, Nathan Perry put us on to this one, and he tagged us in it because this guy, Ref the District, asked, he said it's officially the offseason for the Washington football team. He wants to know in the last 20 years, which draft pick slash free agent caused the most damage? Donovan McNabb, Albert Hainsworth, RG3, Josh Doxson, or random ones that you can think of. Who had the mo who caused the most damage? Sheesh. Um I'll probably go RG3 just for the simple fact of when you draft a quarterback that high and you give up that much capital to get that said quarterback, and that said quarterback only has one good year and never finishes a complete year ever again. Well, doesn't even complete a whole year, his whole Washington career, honestly. Um, you got to go to RG3, just for, like I said, when you give up that much capital, and you, whenever you draft a quarterback that high and it doesn't hit, it sets your franchise back a good two, three, four years where you got to recycle, rebuild, retool everything again. So... Yeah, all the. I mean, those are all bad, like draft picks and signings. But I had to go RG three. Uh, I'll go with Josh Doxson only because, like, the Josh Doxson pick sent th ripples throughout this organization. <laughs> it caused like so much dysfunction it, with Scott McLuhan, with Dan Snyder, Bruce Allen, and it just caused this snowball effect turning into a gigantic ball that just plowed over everyone essentially. So I'll go with Josh Doxson just because you already picked the probably the smartest one you can look at it and easiest and just say, uh, well, yeah, it makes sense. RG3, because they didn't have a first round pick for the next couple of years, the team was <laughs> ass. I get it. But I'm just yeah. saying from an organizational standpoint with how much negativity, negative energy it brought and what came with it, I think the Josh Doxson pick. I mean, yeah, yours does actually make a little bit more sense just because the simple fact of, yeah, RG3, that shit, it blew us up. But we also got Kirk Cousins out of it for him. We had a couple winning years in between there, so <laughs> – uh, Reed just texted me. I, I, I'm not. I'm not going to tell you guys what he said, but it's hilarious. He's excused. All right. Uh, now our next question <laughs> oh is, God, is, is, <laughs> is from In It to Win It. Our dude Tyler. Thank you, Tyler. I appreciate you, brother. He wants to know: Would you rather keep our second rounders for the next three years, that. or trade them for two thirds in each year for the next three years? What was it? Sorry, I was reading that. Story. I know you were. Would you rather <laughs> keep our second rounders? for the next three years or trade them for two thirds in each year for the next three years. So we keep our th second round picks for the next three years, or we trade them away to get three third round picks for the next three years. Basically his thought process is we don't hit on second rounders, but we hit on yeah, third rounders. I know. Yeah. I knew where it's going. Um, I mean, look, you got to go with the history for the past couple of years. We've not hit on a second rounder. Well, Sam Cosme hopefully will be like the, the first time in like a while we hit on a second rounder. But yeah. I mean, look at the track record over the past couple of years. Terry, Antonio Gibson, this year, Deami Brown, and Benjamin St. Juice. Obviously, we don't know how they're going to play, but the potential is definitely there. So I would probably go with the third rounders and because those are the gems. Those have been the gems so far. Yeah, look, I'm not a GM, but I will tell you I'm a GM on Madden. And when I'm a GM on Madden, the second round has no talent. All, dude, every time you get a second rounder, the guy does not pan out unless you find out he has a late round, first round designation, right? So uh, just for the 
just to do have fun here, I'll say the third rounders, just because I like that spot where you can take a chance on somebody that was supposed to be a second rounder but fell to the third. You, you kind of have that flexibility, flexibility there, and then in that third round, you could also go and get your guy that you might think you lose out on the fourth, that you could go jump a little bit. I think that would make a lot of sense. Yeah, also on top of that, like Ryan said earlier when we had him on, third round guys, you're kind of just drafting them on – potential it's not really like a second round guy it's like okay this guy is supposed to contribute if not day one at some point in the season third rounder is kind of like all right you don't got to contribute year one but by year two you better be doing something you better be on the field doing something so yeah i'll go with the third rounder yeah and jay dilla our next guy he said how hard is it he said how hard is it finding new stuff to talk about in these podcasts at the free Uh, agency and the draft in the (laughs) offseason i i will tell you it's not it's not hard for me personally uh, there's things every day. You just have to be creative. You got to think of it. You got to be able to have points of discussion. I know it's probably probably maybe boring for everybody else, but I just love watch it, talking Washington football. And like I said on Twitter, dude, I like making lemonade. When life gives you lemons, you know, make something of it. And this is the situation we're in, but we always find something to do. And we're grateful for all the fans because they help us out as well with all the fan questions and everything. It kind of keeps the conversations going. So without them, without you guys, we wouldn't be able to get it done. Yeah, I mean, 100%. I mean, if you remember, go back to last year, whenever it was this time of the season, we were just like, so what are we going to talk about? We're like scrambling. <laughs> like, oh, let's think of something. It's like, it's bit season. Let's think of some bits. Now it's kind of just like we're flowing. We're kind of just talking about this, talking about that. We're getting guests on. So right. it's not, I mean, it seems hard. It does like, but in reality, if you like talking football, it's not really that hard. No, it's not. Now, our next question is from our all-star VIP fan, Tony Shivers. He said, which defensive player do you predict predict ends up with the most interceptions this season? Mm, man. I'll go friend of the show and guess a couple of episodes past. I'll go Cam Curl. I think that he's going to hmm. continue his momentum from year one into year two. You saw last year he was all around the ball, picking off balls, scooping scores. So I definitely think that this is gonna, he's going to shine on the brightest level in year two um i think it's kendall fuller uh personally kendall fuller has probably one of the best hands in the secondary right now william jackson i'm not saying that you can't catch an interception he obviously can't he just doesn't get tested very much and so uh, with the pass rush with the added ability of uh william jackson and possibly benjamin st juice with his length and his press man ability on the other side i think kendall fuller is going to have an opportunity to have a huge year statistically he's going to be uh, have the ability to be able to read with his eyes, be able to judge quarterbacks, and go and do what he does, and he's a playmaker, and that's what he does. So if I'm going to go with anyone, it's Kendall Fuller. I think that he's going to benefit from a lot of opportunities with this pass rush. Yeah, nah, I mean, that's a good one. I just think that Cam Curl, with yeah. this pass rush being so lethal, so deadly, this front four, this front seven being so crucial, so fast, so fast off the ball, quarterback's going to have to get the ball out really quick. You saw last year with, like, Cam, we had Cam Curl on. He explained what he saw when he picked off Zach Ertz right. and uh, took it to the house. So I just think that he's going to be year two in the system. He's going to be around the line of scrimmage a lot. Quarterback's got to get the ball out really quick, really fast against his defense. Opportunity is going to be there. Absolutely. Now, our next one from Tony. For, for one signature play, would you rather obliterate someone in the NFL like Sean Taylor did to that punter or posterize dunk on someone in the NBA? Oh, man, I'd probably go posterize someone in the NBA because that's 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 like posters are like talked about and thought about way more down the line than like crucial ass like hits. I mean, look, everyone always plays a Sean Taylor hit on the punter, but it's only during the Pro Bowl. You know what I'm saying? You see highlights of guys getting posters from all the way back to Kobe Bryant when he posters somebody all the way back to Vince Carter dunking up, dunking up for somebody in the Olympics. And I was like. 2004 or something like that so posters live on forever crucial hits only live on in like certain moments and like they replay them in like certain moments but i will say as someone that used to lay people out on the football field there's no better feeling than just smacking the hell out of somebody just putting them on their ass so oh without a doubt it's hitting somebody and obliterating them without a doubt because i understand that it's kind of like a posterizing someone in the nba when you do that it's kind of like a, a it's now um, big dick moment you know what i'm saying like you're like ah, i'm swinging you know what i'm saying <laughs> and and so in the nfl i understand like how it's kind of different but in the way where 
because like on the football field, dude, there was there was people I can't explain it that literally had no regard for personal safety on the football field. Literally just went a hundred thousand miles an hour and said, "I'm gonna run you over. It doesn't matter what you have. I don't care what's in front of me." That kind of thing is absolutely incredible when you see that live. When you see that in person, that's something you'll never see ever again. And you can kind of feel that kind of energy. That is what you want. And that's what I would much rather have. Literally being able to take the breath out of somebody's chest because of how hard you hit them and your your energy is dictating where they're going, that's what I'm doing, dude, all day long. All day long. Yeah, I feel you. I'm just – when you dunk on somebody, that's like a lot more personal. You know what I'm saying? It's only 10 people – total on the court at a time football you got 22 people on the field everything's moving fast as hell basketball you got the guy with the ball it's one-on-one you drive him to the basket you cannot you can't miss it you get, you put a guy on his ass on the football field sometimes you might not see it on camera you might miss it you gotta see the replay you get dunked on everybody's seeing that yeah now that's a good point that's a good point made by you now uh if, if you, any of you guys are fans of dave Chappelle, if you've ever seen the movie half baked uh, I'm not going to tell you why Reed is not here, but his nickname from now on is Fish. Fish, 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 fish. <laughs> That's the best one. He's in the mirror looking at himself. He's like, oh, we got to get out of here. <laughs> Turning into a fish. Oh, God, what a great movie. Oh, uh, man. Next Poor time man. I want my fruit. All right, you guys. We will see you guys on Tuesday. Make sure you do not miss it. We will be back with Reed, I promise. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. We want to hear from you guys. Do you want to comment on who you think that we should have answered with some of these with Ben St. Juice and Diami Brown? If you want to answer some of these questions, who deserves to have a stadium outside of Washington? But, oh, I almost forgot. Today's 84, 84 days until the start of the NFL season. It's Randy Moss, Andre yeah. Reed, but it, it's Randy Moss, dude, all day. I mean, Randy Moss is my favorite NFL player of all time. That's a dude I grew up watching from even in Marshall at college. Right. He was a beast. And that's a guy that I like, tried to like model my game after, like wide receiver wise. So I mean, even if even if he wasn't the greatest eighty four, he's my greatest eighty four. So yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in for us. Uh, please comment. Let us know your opinion. We want to go back and forth with you. We want to hear what you think in these sort of situations. And if you want to ask fan questions or you want to freestyle on the next episode, let us know. Send us a message, comment, and I'll make sure to add you. Get your email address, and we'll be able to coordinate. All right, everybody. It's- Hot bars. Yes, sir. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, everybody. We will see you guys on Tuesday, all right? Washington football. Hey! I promise I won't have much mouth next week, I promise. <laughs> What's up, everyone? This is Kyle from the Burgundy Zone. We are releasing our own merch to support the show. If you want to rock the Burgundy Zone logo or you want to see Reed's face on your shirt, we got it. We're starting with T-shirts, hoodies, and zip-up. So if you're a fan of the show, make sure you snag one before they are gone. Check out the link in our bio on Instagram, or you can find the link in the description of the video. Thanks again for all your support. Until next time.